All right, there is no textbook for this class in philosophy. I am your textbook. However, I'm going to rely on various sources that I'll provide to you. For example, today I'm going to hand out to you a little reading which is called The Apology. Does anybody know off the top of your head who wrote The Apology? Is this brand new to you? Ever heard of it? The Apology. It's a famous piece of philosophical literature. Spencer? Plato is correct. Very good. Anybody know the circumstances of the authorship of the Apology? What was Plato describing in this writing? Anybody know? You happen to know? Go ahead. He was apologizing. Uh, the good thought, he was apologizing, but apologizing in the way that an apology is framed in a class like apologetics. So he wasn't apologizing in kind of the casual sense, but it's the more technical sense. So what's going on, Nicole? It only tangentially, good thought, Plato's world of the forms is only <laughs> passingly mentioned in there. Spencer, one more bite at the apple and we'll... Well, he was obviously like, he was defending something. Yes. So he was defending his beliefs about the morality of the world. Excellent thought, good thought. Not quite, but good stab <laughs> at the dark there. This is uh, Plato are really reporting for us the defense that Socrates gave when he was on trial for his life in Athens. Now you remember from Bible context, if not from elsewhere, it's only been, what, four years. The year that Socrates died, executed for crimes against the state in the city of Athens, that year was Thousands of hands in the air. What is it, Josiah? What year was it? I know we're in the BC era. We're B. <laughs> Excellent. Yes, that's good. Good start. Okay. We're in the BC era. <laughs> no, sorry, pal. Not even close. Anybody know? Right, go ahead. Yeah. Uh huh. Uh, well, you were closer. Three ninety nine. Three ninety nine. And this is the uh, this is the defense that Socrates gave to the jury of the Athenians who was evaluating whether he should live or die. It's a classic piece in philosophical history. My point right now is not to start talking about it directly, but simply to say to you, I'm going to give you handouts like this through the years, or through the year, not years plural. And uh, these will be your responsibility to read and digest, and, and when I give you tests from time to time, uh, their content will be part of what I will check out, and we'll talk about them to some degree in class. The purpose for your binder is to keep track of these handouts. And so I will try to remember to hole punch them as I have here so they'll easily go into your binder. Uh, hence, you don't want to just toss them in there, you know. Some students have a bad habit of just kind of cramming stuff in to their binders. And then eventually their binder looks like it was hit by a nuclear bomb and you just don't want that to happen. So that's, uh, that's the deal. All right. Philosophy, philosophia, phileo, or phile is the noun, it's a verb. Sophia means what? What's the fundamental, rudimentary etymology of the word philosophy? And it is, Ben? Right, it's the love of wisdom. It is exactly that. Love of wisdom. Philosophy typically is conceived of in three great branches. Okay. Three broad thematic areas. And those three areas are, the words are, first of all, ontology, O-N-T-O-L-O-G-Y,
Secondly, epistemology, E-P-I-S-T-E-M-O-L-O-G-Y. And thirdly, the word that would be less commonly used, but I like it because it rhymes. And to me, that's the main thing. <laughs> and it's the word axiology. All right, so those three words. What is ontology? Any idea? Jordan, do you know what ontology is? Is that a brand new word? Do you have some idea what it might refer to? Uh, Anybody? Ontology? Sydney? It's the study of being. It is, exactly. It's the study of being. Isn't that helpful? What is being? What is that? Sydney, do you have any idea? It's the study of being. What's that supposed to mean? Yes, yes, Sydney. I always thought that something kind of like who we are, our essence, and why we exist. Okay, well, you're, you're on the right. Another word that's used there sometimes is essence. Who we are in our essence uh, would be a, a more narrow idea. It's much broader than that, but it would be included in that. Being. What is that? Trevor, any idea? What, what do you think? Um, not exactly. Not how we came about, although that might be implied in it. Yeah. Anybody want to take a stab at this? It's, you know, you say the word being is pretty common, isn't it? We talk about a human being. You know. We talk about being at the soccer game. Talk about, you know, it's a word we use all the time, isn't it? Probably multiple times a day. What is being? That's the question. What is it? What, are we, what do you suppose we're studying when we're dealing with being? Or more technically, ontology. Avery, go ahead. Generally existence? Yes. Almost. Hang on to that, though. Avery says existence. I want to just play with that a little bit and make it. You had your hand in the air. I was going to say reality. Reality. That's really the idea. So for for now, this is all you need to understand: is that this is the question of what is actually real. And technically, Avery, philosophy has concluded that to exist is not quite to be real. Okay? And it's an odd little thing. There's, if you think about these two words, being, what would be the absolute opposite of being? What would we, would we call that? The opposite of being would be what do you think, Mr. Culverson? What would be the opposite of being? Um. Good start. <laughs> non. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. It is. It's called non-being. And another term that's sometimes used for that is nothingness. I want you to all close your eyes and try to imagine for 10 seconds nothing. I mean nothing, not no space, no time, nothing. Nothing. <laughs> you may not feel your neighbor. <laughs> I don't know what that has to do with the exercise, but Culverson's over there feeling Joe. I don't know what's up with this. <laughs> all right. The human mind, it's pretty well demonstrated, is not capable of thinking of nothing, you know. 
to try to think of nothing is, is the human brain sort of starts blowing fuses there after a while. But, um, but that's the opposite of being. So being has to do with something is actually there. Nothingness has to do with the fact that there's nothing. And existence, Avery, is somewhere in the middle. The, the literal meaning of that word from its Latin derivatives is existare, which is to stand out of. And the meaning was to stand out of being. To exist, in other words, is sort of this place of having one foot in being and one foot in nothingness. It's transient. It's changing. And philosophy has always thought, you know, if there's something that is, that's there that seems to be changing and transient, there must be something behind it that is not changing and is not transient. That is there sort of as a fixed reality. And what is that? So that's what we're talking about with ontology. We're talking about what is really behind the scenes real. All right, what about epistemology? Now, don't, if you didn't quite get that, don't worry about it. We'll be spending more time, way more time on that as we go along. But for now, let's get something in your notes. What is epistemology, Stephen? It's the study of uh, knowledge or knowing. Okay. It's the study of knowledge as such. It's not knowledge of any particular thing. It's knowledge of knowledge. You know. We all think we know some things. I think I know the Pythagorean theorem. I think I know that, you know, it's the middle of the day. I think I know this. I think I know that. There's things in my head here that I think I know. Epistemology is turning the question back on that whole idea of knowing in and of itself and asking, what is this thing that I call knowledge? How do I come to know anything? How do I know that what I think I know is actually corresponding to anything that's real? So in terms of the connection, we've got ontology as the question, what is real? Epistemology is the question, how do I know what is real? And how do I know that what I think is real really is? Maybe Trevor here is just a Fig Newton of my imagination. <laughs> Maybe I had some bad pizza last night. And some strange indigestion happened, and this guy ain't here. Maybe he's just a hallucination. Whoever saw the movie A Beautiful Mind? Huh? Great movie. It, may, it got me to thinking after I watched the movie. Are you really there? Or am I just kind of creating you out of some sort of schizophrenia that I got? You ever wondered that? You know? Sometimes you have an optical <laughs> illusion. You sort of experience something, you think you see it, and then it, it's not quite what you thought you saw. So it really is the whole question of how we know, how we have confidence with respect to the things we know. Uh, axiology, the, the, the word you've heard for this one is actually something we've studied together, but we're looking at it in a slightly different way. We'd otherwise call it But unfortunately, ethics doesn't rhyme with ontology and epistemology. And you will sometimes hear this word used. This is the question, you might say in broad terms, what should I do about it? All right, so what is, what is real? How do I have confidence that what I think is real really is? And, and once I reach that, what should I do about it? Is there a shouldness? Is there an oughtness to life? Is there some kind of responsibility that falls to me because, you know, I have come to know certain things that are real. Let me just say, uh, as we're kind of reaching the conclusion here of this first session together, I have heard from countless, um, well, countless, I guess that's a little overstated. I've heard from several, we'll put it that, a little more modest here. Uh, graduates who've come back and come to me privately usually and said, you know, of all the classes that I took at the Oaks, philosophy is what helped me the most. 
Now, I don't know, maybe they go tell every teacher that. <laughs> they go say to Mr. Arnold, it was Latin that just got me there, Mr. Arnold. <laughs> I don't know. They, so I, I, at this point, I don't, I don't know. But at least I think these are sincerely driven comments. Because uh, what you're going to cover in this class is, um, an, is a historical survey of the thinkers in history that have created the world in which you live uh, intellectually, in terms of the culture, the values, and so on. And, I, and to me, I, I, I never tire of teaching it. And my experience is that students, again and again, have these sort of aha moments, you know, as, as you're going along and you begin to see that the, what you see on TV is a culture that's been produced by certain forces. You may know nothing much about Friedrich Nietzsche, but if you know Nietzsche, you'll see him in every TV commercial you watch, you see. You may not know a lot about, you know, Hegel or, you know, other characters, but if you learn to see how they have shaped your world, then as you look at your world, you'll say, wow, that was really Hegelian. And you're not just kind of showing off that you know something about Hegel, you'll really realize that we're, we didn't just plop into this world kind of, you know, out of the blue, that there are forces that have created uh, the world in which you live. And so while these ideas may seem somewhat academic, sterile, not very significant or even relevant, trust me, uh, by the time we start looking at some of this, you'll see that, uh, if you're paying attention, you know, if you're half awake, I think you'll see that uh, it's not only relevant, but extremely helpful. And I really am sincere about that. And I, every year I've usually had some you know, graduate from the Oaks who comes by visiting and they always want to come into this class and give a pep talk to the seniors who are taking philosophy and usually the pep talk will go something like this. I never solicit it, I never write the script for it, but I'm always happy when it happens. They'll come in and say, you guys need to really pay attention to this is going to help you when you get to college. So I want to be the first on the block, you know, to, uh, to give you that encouragement that uh, it's not easy material. And some of the reading you'll say, whoa, you know, I didn't get anything out of that. But, but kind of work with it and you'll find that in the great scheme of things, I think you'll find it uh, pays off. All right.